moderate. And thanks so much to the panelists, the awesome filmmakers who have taken the time to be here. I'll start by quoting one of them, my dear friend Molly Thompson, who sent me an email the other day in which she wrote, please God, don't make this into a dreary docs or doomed discussion. We all know it's a struggle. Let's look at the bright spots. Here, here, I say. Tonight we shall look at the bright spots, for there are many indeed. And in the spirit of making the evening non-dreary, I would like to begin by challenging Oprah Winfrey to a duel, or at least by respectfully calling into question her introduction to the documentary section of last year's Academy Awards. With a global audience numbering in the hundreds of millions, Oprah took to the stage of the Kodak Theater and declared, after 83 years of Oscars, here's one thing we know for sure. If we're feeling lousy, if the news is bad and people are hurting, what do we do? We go to the movies and we escape. Then she shifted gears. But I'm here to present the award to the best movie that did not let us escape, the outstanding documentary of the year. Oprah went on to describe last year's crop of documentaries as illuminating and important, often made by those working against great odds, some of whom are imprisoned for their efforts. It all sounded very grave indeed. Please don't get me wrong, I'm thrilled that Oprah is supporting documentary film, and everything she said that night was true. Also, I thought she looked awesome in her Zach Posen. But by using all of those medicinal terms and by setting documentaries in opposition to the other films that were being honored at the Oscars, I genuinely think Oprah got it wrong. Documentaries aren't unlike real mu movies. Documentaries are real movies. I'm not naive. I know that documentaries have a unique relationship to real people and to historical events, but so did the King's speech. And I know that documentaries deal with important issues and events of the day, but so did The Hurt Locker. Like movies with scripts and actors, some documentaries set out to explore important issues, but lots of them don't. And all films, scripted and unscripted, like all works of art, have a view of the world that defines their content. But when it comes to being entertaining and engaging, delightful and exciting, transformative, and yes, sometimes even escapist, documentaries are real movies. We don't make medicine, we make films. And the great news is that never has this been more evident than it is, than it is in the many terrific films that are being ra made right now at this very moment. At times like this, I can't help but think of the final moments of Fax Barr and George Hickenlooper's wonderful documentary, Hearts of Darkness, in which Francis Ford Coppola, speaking in 1978, envisions the future of film. The great hope, he says, is these little video recorders. Some people who normally wouldn't make movies are going to be making them. And suddenly, one day, some little fat girl in Ohio is going to be the new Mozart and is going to make a beautiful film with her father's little camera. Is there any doubt that the film that that little girl is going to make is going to be a documentary? I think not. Many observers have described this time as the new golden age of nonfiction film. And that is what we are here to celebrate tonight in what I hope will be a lively discussion among some of America's most gifted and important filmmakers, whom I will now ask to join me on stage. Molly Thompson of A&E Indie Films, filmmakers Ricky Stern, Lourdes Portillo, Davis Guggenheim, and Amir Barlett. Act to follow, RJ. That was What's that? Say? That was great. Oh, thank you very much. I wrote it myself. I have nothing to add. Oh, well, let's move down a little. Can I ask you to um, I've told each of the panelists this evening that we're speaking tonight not of commerce but of art and process and filmmaking. And Molly, let me begin with you. Let's talk, indeed, about the bright spots. Later on, I will read to you other emails that Molly has sent to me. <laughs> but you have to ask me in private. Um, Molly, are we living in a new golden age of documentary film? Yeah, I was thinking about this. You know, and you told me you were going to quote me, and I didn't believe you. And you told me you were going to start with me, and I didn't believe you. <laughs> so, um, you know, 
I mean, you're talking to people who are able to get their films made, and I think that for, for many people, it is a golden age of documentary film. I think for some people, they might consider it a dust bowl of documentary film. But, but there are plenty of ways to get films made now and plenty of places to, to look for funding, and there are a lot of people who, are, who would like to be able to distribute films. I, I, what, what does it mean to be in a golden age? Um, I'm not sure what that means, but, but I think there are a lot, a lot of wonderful films around these days, and it's exciting. It's an exciting time for me to, to be working with all these wonderful filmmakers. I think uh, certainly uh, you can see just by the, the, um, the range of films that we saw tonight, the range of form, the range of subject matter, um, that, uh, that in and of itself argues for it. Um, the kind of uh, 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 vastly growing means of distribution. Um, I think I feel as though there's strong argument. But let's step back, um, and I want to start really by asking Amir and and each of the rest of you: How did you get started making documentary films? What what compelled you? How on earth did you choose this profession? <coughs> well. Um, it's, it's kind of embarrassing. I, I used to do liquid light shows, you know, those hippie liquid light shows. <laughs> so uh, there's not much business in that. Um, that led me to uh, editing. And then, um, so that was, that was my trade for a long time. And, and, uh, and I went to, uh, I had gone to film school in the Czech Republic. And I met these two old guys there. And after editing in, uh, in the Bay Area for a while, um, and doing, you know, Levi's Industrials and Gap Industrials and stuff like that, I decided to make my first documentary about those two old Czech guys. So that's how I started. Yeah, Davis. Um, well, my, my father made documentary films, uh, who was a member of the Academy, and uh, I, I move out. I drove out here in my Volkswagen Jetta in 1988 with one plan, which was never to make documentaries, because that's <laughs> what my father did. And I, and I worked as a, an assistant and then um, associate producer on some movies, and then I got fired off a big Hollywood movie. I was like set to do a big movie at a big studio, and it was awful. <laughs> and uh, it was just wrong in the classic Hollywood sense. Everyone misbehaved, and uh, I was shattered. And I bought one of those little cameras that Coppola was talking about, <laughs> and I made a film about five public school teachers, which is inside the clip you saw. And then I'm, I was hooked. And uh, and uh, there you are. And 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 you know, careful making plans, right? <laughs> yeah. Ricky. Um, I I think I started because my brother, who's in the audience, was making films when we were kids, and I was always the actor. I was the evil doer, and I was the innocent bystander. And um, and then when I went to college, I w I really came from it through the theater, from a, a theater background. When I was in college, I picked up a camera and I made a film about a girl who was in the Special Olympics, and, and I really related to her in a weird way. I just felt like, uh, uh, you know, that I think as my films are really about people, about characters and the way an actor approaches a character, and um, the first film I did was out of college, was about a youth program in Harlem, and uh, I met a boy when I was volunteering, and I told the story through this boy's eyes. Lotus? Let's see, um, I used to live in Los Angeles. I'm an immigrant. And um, when I came here, which was a long time ago, um, I had um, just graduated from high school and there was a girl who was making films for, uh, for an educational film company called Britannica Films. And she asked me to help as a PA and I didn't know what it was or anything. So um, uh, all the students, were UCLA students and they shot this film about a little blind boy. And I kind of got the hang of it. I thought I knew what I was doing. And um, so I helped and everybody was very nervous. And I remember the producer, he was an Armenian man. I can't remember his name. But he came up to me and he said, you know, you're the only one who knows what they're doing. <laughs> and I thought, really? <laughs> this must be my profession. <laughs> So, you know, I started taking a real interest in it, and eventually I moved to the Bay Area, and I worked with uh, um, documentarians there, and I decided that I didn't qu 
quite like what was happening, so I went to art school and got a degree in fine arts, and then I made documentaries. Um, I'm just remembering that Mike Nichols once said that directing is like uh, making love. You never really get to see anybody else do it, so you really don't know if you're <laughs> getting it right or not. Um, which leads me to want to ask how each of you decide to, uh, to say yes, to take to an idea. I mean, we have so many ideas, and we all know by now what's involved in making one of these films, and there's so much that might argue against uh, choosing against any individual idea. But using the films that we saw tonight, to tell us a little bit about what led you to make that film and how perhaps it, it's... Uh, uh, indicates the things that you look for in a, in a subject. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about The Devil Never Sleeps. I had already made uh, a real documentary, and this one uh, was um, about an incident that happened in my family, and I felt, um, it's, it's strange to say it, but I felt possessed by an idea. I thought it was really important to tell the story as I was experiencing it. And um, it, it, that's, it possessed me, and I just didn't ever want it to let it go. So I is, do you find that it, has possession been consistent in, the f in what, what drives sometimes, you? you can't, sometimes you can't keep sometimes it's, a, sometimes it's a, a wonderful idea. You know, possession is very special. Mm. Yeah. Ricky? Um, I think possession. I think that's ha usually what happens. I mean, I think usually you can't not make the movie. For me, it's always like, ugh, I have to go make that movie. <laughs> you know, like, ugh, must I? But it, it, and I, we always say it's like, you know, you put your toe in the water and all of a sudden you're swimming. You're like, oh, I'm now making this movie. I don't know if I want to make this. But you, you, it's, it's, the subject is just like, I have to go and make that movie. And with Joan, it was very casual. I, I, um, because I, ha I knew her very, not, not very well, but um, I had an introduction to her. And when I, the next day, I was sitting in front of her. In fact, I was sitting in a chair, and she was on a stool below me. She's very strategic that way. <laughs> and um, she was looking up at me with those little innocent eyes. And she sat there for about an hour just, like, telling, you know, she was so, I know it sounds stupid, but very vulnerable and very youthful and very open. And in that just one meeting, I thought, oh, my God, I've got to do this movie about her. Be and, and it fed into all my interests in like theater and, and working in the theater and just being this, oh, she's this consummate performer and I felt there hadn't really been a film that I could think of that really um, documented sort of what it's like to be in, uh, you know, a full-time performer, you know, and um, so that's how that film came about. Thanks. Like for, for me, uh, I, 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 I'm learning to distrust my clever side meaning the, the side which thinks I should do this. And uh, w the story about Waiting for Superman is that Diane Wireman, who was going to be here tonight, called me and said, would you like to make a movie about public education? And I said, absolutely not. <laughs> I, I, I did that. I said, look, I made a film eight years, ten years ago, and, and uh, it was a very, you know, and, um, and I said, it can't be done. Like, you know, just, and, I, and no, thank you, but no. And, and, and um, the clever side of me said, you know, don't go there. And then for months, just like you guys were just talking about, there was this sort of gnawing feeling that um, the things I learned making the first film um, were still boiling inside of me. And that, um, and I was in this mode of like making choices for my own kids. And uh, uh, whereas before I was making the film in the abstract, now is, and I said, well, maybe that's the way of doing it. And and, you, and the two films are like completely opposite. One is verite, and one sort of I don't know what it is, but, um, and, uh, and so that gnawing feeling of like, uh, why did I say no? And, 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 and it, was, it was, I couldn't, like that possession, you can't let it go. And, um, uh, and then I, I uh, and the, the, so the personal aspect of, of the feeling, so ignore clever and, and trust feeling, of that feeling of driving by these schools on the way to take my kids to a great school. Mm -hmm. I was like, that was the, the fuel that, that and, I, and I still didn't know how to do it. But, and then I read this article that um, Tom, Thomas Friedman wrote about the lottery uh, in the New York Times. I was like, oh, that's the movie. Like, if I, I, if I could, and, and so that's, that's how that movie got sort of going. I mean, I think uh, 
the, I think the possession thing is interesting. It, it, there's this thing that happens where you start to see the story as a window into some wider, and it becomes almost like this mystical thing where you're going down this rabbit hole about this particular story, but it starts connecting to all these, like everywhere. You start seeing it everywhere. And that's how Pat Tillman was for me. I started to, you know, um, things about the way he was lionized and, and, uh, and the kind of mythology around him, I would see it in all these disparate places. You know, I'd just be watching TV about something completely different, and I'd say, that's Pat Tillman, you know, that's Pat Tillman. It's like, um, and that's one of the, I think, the cool things about these stories is if you spend, um, you know, like two, three years on a story the way most of us usually, you know, do, uh, the more granular you get and the more disciplined you get about trying to tell this one story, the more it connects in this almost like, you know, ineffable way to, to everything, to a lot of things. And, uh, and then you have to fight, I find that I always want to put those things into the film and, you know, my producers like Molly and, and my editor, they all roll their eyes and go, oh God, you know, like, that's, unco and, you, and so you have to, it, it's like you start with this wide thing which you eventually scale back and hopefully if you get it right, it, it points to these other things without, like my editor once said to me, yeah, but you start making all these connections and then you're just basically saying everything is everything, <laughs> which means nothing. <laughs> you know? Or that you're so smoking a, too much. Yeah, fun. right, yeah. yeah. So, um, I'm back to the light shows. <laughs> but uh, anyhow, so, y you know, so I think that's, that's the kind of thing is you know you're on to something when, you're, when it has all these lacunae and connections to yeah. other things. Molly remember, had remember when Tillman was going to be animated, <laughs> partly animated? Yeah, no, I, I remember when it was going to be theatrical, too. Yeah, and, and that's a great thing about Molly is that she doesn't panic when I, you know, run these ideas by her because she knows I'll run through them eventually. It's a process. Yeah, it's a process. <laughs> yeah. Well, so I have the good fortune and the horrible <coughs> responsibility of, of being the recipient of a filmmaker's ideas. And it's, it's a big responsibility, you know, people really... I think it's extremely hard to find a film that you want to spend, how many years does it take? Three, pretty much, about three years mm. with before it even gets out to the distribution phase a lot of the time. And so, you know, I, I really take that very seriously. But um, I often uh, find myself in the position of saying no to a lot of things. And, and right, Ricky? <laughs> no. Ricky, you'll never let me live this down. But anyway, the, and the, um, you know, I think what re resonates with me is is a, a, gr a great deal of filmmaker's passion, but also, you know, there has to be s a film that's going to be lasting. There has to, it has to have a lasting impact. It has to be relevant in five years and in ten years. And, and I think as I watched all these clips, they all have that. They really do. They carry that lasting significance. And, you know, in addition, they're, they're great stories. They have a specificity about them, and they have a universality about them, and both of those things are necessary so you know it's it's you know it's one of those I, I know it when I see it or I try to think I know it when I see it I don't always know it when I see it what well, you're um you've, I, I decided if you mentioned it again I wouldn't let it go so will you tell oh us God. the story you're referring well, to with Ricky I had a cold uh, no. <laughs> she was she had a cold the whole, and she had this little television and she watched the first 10 minutes of my Joan cut and she was like sneezing and blowing her nose and I and tell, the, tell the blowing laughing. your nose bit again <laughs> <laughs> and I and I said so finally I was like why don't we just turn it off because you clearly don't like this and you didn't I didn't like it at all I didn't like Joan I didn't like the Joan I didn't think she was funny sorry Joan I didn't think I it, it I felt it was difficult to watch and and I never thought I was wrong until I saw the finished movie and I was like oh <laughs> mm, I really got that one wrong. But but you said something early, if I may, that like, oh, we sit up here and we can make our, get our films made. I can't get my films made. I mean, seriously, like we, we're going, you know, after s ideas and projects and Joan didn't get, ma we made Joan, I mean, out of really deferred payment, like two guys on a crew with me. I mean, it was very, very low budget, if you can believe it. And I, I don't think it's always true, even, even sort of if you now have some recognition, it's, it's still pretty hard, just like any, any films are hard to get made, so. So this is why passion must drive us, why we have to um, not be able to not make it, um, why we rely on your perspective, Molly, often, and others in your position, the, your wisdom to see that 
these films, films will stand the test of time. I also, I always kind of end up feeling that the films we make are a combination of what we witness or what we learn while we're making it and then the experience we have ourselves and how we've changed and somehow those two things come together. I think, Amir, that's likely why it feels like it connects to everything because there's so, even though your film about Joan is a film about you, Obviously, your film about Giorgio is a film about you. It's your film about education in America. Re these are deeply personal films, even though they're about these larger subjects. And it's, uh, it, it, they, this makes sense, yes? Feel free to say something, anyway. <laughs> well, clearly, the September issue is about you, then, right? I've, needless to say. <laughs> You're looking very this dashing. Is the time, I must mention John Barbados, with whom I have an exclusive clothing contract. <laughs> Um, that may or may not be true, by the way. Um, uh, as, as we know, Alfred Hitchcock once said, in feature films, the director is God. In documentary films, God is the director. Was he right? Hmm. Amir? Um, hmm. <clears throat> no, you know, I think... Um, I think it's a fallacy that documentary filmmakers are, are just flies on the wall observing reality. Um, you know, I, I've always thought that um, the, 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 the thing I'm aspiring to anyway is, is to be a good improviser. And to improvise, you have to, it's not just anything goes, it's, it's reacting to what is happening and, and tacking. I always think about it as like, uh, I mean, I've never sailed, really, but I imagine that if you sail a boat, <laughs> say, and the wind is coming the wrong way, um, you know, you, you, you have to kind of, you have to accept some of the force and then also add your own, um, and, and also have, uh, um, I'll go with the nautical theme, I mean, you have to, like, set your sights on, on where you think the story is going um, and be ready to change it. But if you don't th have an idea of where you think it's going, then you're just, you're not really making a film. Now, I don't know if that's how God works, but that's how I work. Davis. Uh, well, I mean, it makes me think of um, uh, Greg Fitton, who's here tonight, the great, the editor, great editor, who might have a bit of God on him. He, he edited uh, Waiting for Superman, and, and you, none of us can be here without the editors we work with, and, and they never get enough credit, but it's, um, it is, um, it's a group thing, I think. And you know, Greg is like brilliant, and all. Uh, um, what's interesting when I watch the, the clips tonight is that is that they're all so different and they're all so unique. So I don't think you get. That's what's so fantastic when you talk about the golden era is is that a, uh, you know, there are some great Hollywood movies each year. There are a handful of them that you go, wow, that's so. And then the large majority just bore the hell out of me, and the mo the clips of the movies I saw tonight are just wonderful, and so some are made. You know, with it, with with different doses of God, I think. You know, God is. I mean, you are waiting for that kid to say that thing, and for Joan Rivers to be a certain way. So yeah, you are in the hands of. And then I think um, every documentary is crafted differently. It, with a diff it, in, in the in, I think what's so exciting, is that there's so, not not that all documentaries are personal, but the documentary films now are reflective of the personalities of the people who make them. Um, and that's why it's so exciting. And um, yeah. yeah, sorry, you just reminded me of something that I just want to interject, which is there is a way in which you are God, which is that you're setting up the formal rules for the film in a way that a fiction film can't. That is where uh, Oprah is right. The difference is that we have the full power. There is an infinite amount of ways that you can tell a documentary, um, and you set the rules up in the first five or ten minutes. And that's, I was so glad that there were so many beginnings of films because you can really see that, like, you know, well, in this one, um, you're going to hear the director's voice, you know, and uh, this one. Uh, I mean, it's just, it, I think you know, the, the, the w that striking scene of, of uh, Joan's face at the beginning, um, you know, it's, you're setting up the parameters, and it's not that anything goes. It's that what, what we're, th this is the formal structure. And I think that's, that's a really interesting... I, was, I think about, you know, remember in, um, this is a fiction film, but in, um, in um, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, when they're having that fight on the boughs of the bamboo, I always think about that scene in regards to documentaries because 
you're captivated by that scene and you want them not to fall off the boughs of the bamboo, but it's like, well, wait, wait can they fly or not? Like, if, if not everything goes, they can sort of fly, but they still don't want to trip off those limbs. So you're just, you're, and, you, and he set up the rules about how gravity is going to work in this magical world. We do that at the beginning of our films, but with a much wider palette, I think. And yes. Yeah. Lourdes? Um, I, you know, it's not like being God. It's like having a good idea and having a good crew. And it's like playing jazz. It's like jazz. You have to be able to improvise. Otherwise, you can't make documentaries. You know, if you control too much, tighten it too much, it's not good. So that's how I, I see it. It's more like jazz. We always say, uh, I often say in my films that, um, that directing is what happens in the bar at the end of the day. <laughs> when you're all sitting around and talking about what you just witnessed, what you experienced, what you imagine you might see the next day, and then the next day off you go again, performing your jazz, and you get back together again and see. Ricky. Um, I was all wrapped up in what everyone was saying. Um, yeah, I think, I think I look at it like, what are the stakes? And those stakes sometimes change, but I'm always thinking, well, what's at stake for this person? It's, for me, it comes very much from the characters and I'm always um, kind of writing a fictionalized story in my head about what, what, what I think the story is going to be. And it always changes. And that's where sort of the improvisation comes. And it's hard to learn that. And I always tell students when I t talk to students, you know, you should have your idea of what you, what you think your story is. But don't fret if it doesn't turn out. Because you have to see what you're getting. Mm -hmm. And if you can see what you're getting, that's your story. And I even say that to editors, too. Because sometimes the editors go like, oh, well, let's just get them to say this one sentence. And I'm like, well, let's just see what, what they actually do say and figure out what it is they're saying, not what we want them to say. Because I think sometimes um, having too much control, whether it's an editing or whatever, you know, we're writing the story. Um, and I just say this one thing is I, I started out making a film about a boxing gym in the South Bronx. And this kid was supposed to be the next junior Olympic boxer. And of course, every fight I ever shot, he lost. And he ended up, you know, <laughs> and, and I, I remember, and I was young, and I was like, it's the, what a waste, you know, a year. But what it became about was turning 15. Mm. And in, when you become 15, as a, as a, like, as a potentially a pro athlete, is, the, is a huge turning point. It became this universality thing where, it, you know, it, it tied into everybody else, and, it, and that was the point where he wasn't going to make it. And so it became about something entirely different, but, you know, you just had to kind of figure that out. Oh, great. Oh, great. Um, I'm reminded of another tale I will tell, which is uh, probably the best lesson I ever learned about uh, making documentary film. It uh, occurred sometime in the, uh, long before I was making documentary films, uh, in the early 1980s, I was watching uh, uh, the Edmonton Oilers and the Boston Bruins play a hockey game on television. And in between periods, uh, the uh, announcers were so excited because they had gotten an interview with Wayne Gretzky, who at the time was the probably single most, he was the b greatest athlete in the world and he had won so many Stanley Cups and scoring titles and broken so many records, but he didn't like to speak public publicly, and, uh, but had agreed to and when we all stayed between periods to watch the interview and, uh, and the, the interviewer said, tell us great one, what is your secret, how do you do it? And he said, well it's quite simple, I just follow the puck. And, uh, of course, everybody else was out there playing hockey, trying to get the puck to do what they wanted it to do. But it's really what we do. We have no choice. We must follow the puck. And perhaps if we can see where it goes, where it wants to go, we, we, have, um, we have a story to tell. I'm going to quote Hitchcock one more time. Um, he said, a lot of movies are about life. Mine are like a slice of cake. <laughs> Does he remind you in any way of yourself? And how, so I'll begin with Ricky. Oh my God. <laughs> Mine is like Chinese food. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I was at this before. It's fattening and it's delicious. Um, oh God. I, I want to ask I had this. to answer that you first. Think, well, I warned you earlier. That's why at the bar. I didn't come did, up and did, answer. Um, do you think of your audience? Do you think of the one who is um, enjoying what you're bringing them? This is what it meant to me, and that's really what I want to ask. Mm. Yes. Um, 
Um, I, I like to make entertaining films, films that even if it's about Darfur, that, that you feel you go on a journey, you're there in the moment, you're taken emotionally on this journey. I like to, that's what I like to do. So um, I don't really think of an audience though. I mean, I, I'm, I don't have a good answer for this. I don't so think of an audience. I just think of what I like. Mm. And if I like it, it's usually I feel pretty good about it. Lorna? Uh, I agree. You know, I do think of an audience, peripherally. But I'm really thinking of what would entertain me. And um, it, it's kind of, um, it works, I think. Not, not to be an egomaniac or anything, but I think, you know, we are the antenna. Have you ever changed a film because you've screened it early on for Never. an audience? Mm. Never. Ever. Really? Ever. Nice. Got some. Uh, I would, I would, for me, I think you have to think about your audience. This is just for me. Um, uh, you know, when you think about making a film about public education, and, and this is specifically about, like, you know, um, cause movies. I, I think a lot about the um, many, many years of documentaries that have gone into public schools. And my father made a, a documentary that we were talking about tonight called Children Without, which was like in the f late 50s, I think. And you think of the audience's expectation then, and at that point it was like, wow, they have cameras that are going into tenements, and, and I've never seen that before. And, you know, and so documentaries are so revelatory in that you got to see things you never saw before. And now there's this, I think there's this sense of like, well, I, um, this, Audiences are like, you know, I've seen, s I, I know the public schools, I know, that's, I know that's a problem and, you know, and it's too much and I can't go there. And so I, I feel like as a filmmaker, I have, to, I have to address that baggage that people bring to that issue. And I have to sort of um, uh, start a new relationship with the audience to say, no, 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 come in. You know, this, first of all, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deal, I'm not going to, I'm not going to pander to the audience, I'm not going to, but I'm going to say I'm going to deal with some of those some of that baggage, because I know you, I know you, <laughs> I know you feel like this is impossible, but come in, you know, and 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 uh, I know you feel this, but and so and and I also feel like there's, uh, um, um, the, there are issues of of fatigue. Uh, I think you can see a, a very, very gripping documentary. And after a while, you get just you get compassion fatigue or other other types of information fatigue, and you get stuck. And I think the film has to know where the audience is at that moment, or you lose them. And uh, if you lose them, you know, it's, it, I think it's it's my fault, <laughs> and I have to carry them to the end, or else I'm not gonna, you know, <laughs> communicate what I want to communicate. You also, uh, it's funny, when you started talking about fatigue, I thought you were going to re re refer to the fatigue of the filmmaker. I mean, we sit, <laughs> That's you know, true too. We sit yeah. in the bay, we watch our film again yes, and again and again and again. It, and, and for me, um, I, you, you, I, I can never fool myself when others are watching, even if I'm standing in the back of the room, even if I'm not, if That's I were right. behind a glass wall and I couldn't hear a word they were saying. That's right. You know, you know how you feel when you, it gives you that perspective and kind of wisdom and takes you to a place that you can't get sitting in that edit room watching again, crying because you wish it would all stop, you know. Um, <laughs> they know what I mean. Uh, you know, that's, you know, but I bet anyway. That's the vision of the filmmaker and that's what, you know, I admire so much. I'm thinking about a mirror. So many, so many filmmakers might have passed up the Tillman story. Oh, that story's been told. It's been out there. You know, it's been, or you know, uh, everybody knows it. Everybody saw the hearings. But it takes the f vision of the filmmaker to go back and pull it out and shape it and really create a lasting tale. You know, and that's what I admire so much about all uh, what all of you do. You know, and, and with my kid could paint that. I famously actually, I, I started, I passed on that too. Remember, <laughs> and um, but Amir's I was wrong because I said uh, sixty minutes had scooped you, and I was like, oh, yeah. they got you, and you passed on one of my movies too. Just so you know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to be left out here, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm really pissed off. <laughs> Did you have a cold that day too? <laughs> <laughs> no, and I mean, but I think the fatigue thing is very interesting, uh, and that's why you have a good team around you. You know, that's why. Yeah. You have people you can trust, editors, producers, 
because there comes a time where you can't see it straight anymore. Yeah. And I mean, you know, uh, you have to be able to sort through what advice you're getting that makes sense and what t when everybody else in the world is crazy but you and when you're crazy and everybody else has it right. And I mean, I remember <laughs> on the flip side of that, you know, uh, actually <laughs> being so exhausted that I started to cry when uh, Molly wouldn't let me call the Tillman story on Pat fucking Tillman. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, I think we both started to cry, actually. We were so tired. It wasn't tired actually me, it was yeah. other people. But, but, you, but you, I was wrong. I mean, they, they that, was right. a, that, uh, that was a case in which I was dead wrong. <laughs> you know, and I mean, it's a great, it's, it's fun to talk, to swear. It's fun to swear, but it's, that would have been a horrible <laughs> title. <laughs> isn't, isn't RJ's mother watching? Yeah, oh, well, she is, and she's laughing at home. Okay, good. That's, I, she I'm, thinks it should be called. I feel protected. I'm Pat fucking. She thinks this panel should be called. I'm RJ took it for mother. I'm fucking Pat <laughs> Tillman. Which yeah, yeah, see, we were always concerned yeah. that people would take it for I'm fucking Pat yeah. Tillman. And they did, <laughs> and they did, yeah. Which would be a great movie, by the way. <laughs> Very different. Amir, what about the audience? Do, uh, do you yeah, I, I like what you were saying, uh, Davis, about their expectations. Like, I definitely do think of the audience, and I think about messing with their minds. You know, that's what I, I'm trying to stay one step ahead of them and think about what they're expecting and then, you know, be out in front of them and to show them the other side of it. I just saw, um, well, I didn't just see it. I, one of the best films this year, I thought, was uh, Marshall Curry's film about uh, the environmental terrorists, so-called eco-terrorists. And <clears throat> that's a movie that just messes with your mind at every turn because he lets everybody uh, put their best foot forward. So it, you start out of the gate and you think, oh, these guys are you know, horrible. You know? And then he shows you why they did what they did. And then you take their side. And then he shows you why that was a mistake. And you just go on this ride where you just, by the end, you're stuck. You, know, not, you, you have to think and think and think about who you agree with. And it's this sort of existentialist moment where you realize you're not gonna, there is no... The filmmaker is not God. You're going to have to decide for yourself. But it's because he didn't, he didn't, you know, a lot of filmmakers, they choose who the bad guy is and they telegraph that, you know, in the way that they edit them. And he does the opposite. He, he makes the cops into good guys, the loggers into good guys, the terrorists into good guys, the guy who ratted out his own friends into a good guy. And, and you're just sitting there going, wow, this is amazing. And that's, I, I aspire to try and do that. Great. Um, let's talk a little bit about form. Uh, uh, when do you decide what form your film will take? When do you decide interviews, verite, uh, recreations? Uh, and do you think this is for television, this is for theater? All of those questions. How does content impact form and how do you find yourself considering it? Lourdes? It's a very long question, but I think when you think about form, you're thinking about storytelling. How are you going to tell the story? For example, well, it would be hard to talk about things maybe people haven't seen, but um, w the first documentary that I ever made was because I had seen other documentaries like that. So I kind of imitated the way it was made. The second long documentary, I when I was possessed, I said, um, I want to make, this is a documentary about gossip. And it's about, and I'm going to uh, tell it the way it was told to me by the family. And I am going to uh, use metaphor and allegory and all these other elements, you know, not recreations, they're metaphorical recreations. And, um, and it's going to have the shape of a telenovela. And that's what I, that was my possession. The devil got in me and that's what I, you know, followed. And then there was another documentary that I made that was an investigation of all the women that have been killed in Ciudad Juarez in, in Mexico. And that was an, a kind of a, a journalistic um, investigation, but with a lot of uh, poetic license. So, you know, that's what guides you, you know, the storytelling. But there isn't just one way to tell a story. There's so many ways to tell a story, you know. And I'm always kind of experimenting with that. Because I find it so satisfying. I don't even, I, I forgot what you asked me. <laughs> <laughs> but you answered it beautifully. <laughs> and 
Ricky? Well, I would say that that's exactly what I, you speak for me. I mean, I think it depends on the subject. It depends on... I always try to think of creative ways of, do, of telling, visualizing something. Um, you know, if it's a problem, then usually it's a great way of trying to think other outside the box of trying to fix it. I mean, a lot of our films we've done have like a, a strong verite narrative storytelling, um, but then you know, there's missing time or there's missing footage or there's, you know, people's fantasies and there's different ways you can do that. And, um, and um, but it's always, I think, about trying to make it, um, you know, intimate and, and to put, it, put, put, you know, a spin on it. And I didn't mean to say I don't think about my audience. I think it just becomes part of, it's not labor intensive for me. I, I don't, I don't, um, it's it's very organic, I guess, for me when I think about my audience. Like Joan, I mean, I obviously I was running one day. I mean, I, I thought of that opening shot because I was running one day and I listening to some weird Swedish music and and I was like Joan's naked face in front of me. But I mean, it's a you know, it just came to me. But it and it it's a very obvious opening. You know, I wanted to strip her down and I wanted to get rid of everyone's preconceived notions about yes, she has plastic surgery. That's what it looks like. Get over it. Let's get on and you're going to see a different view of her you've never seen before. So I know it's very obvious, I mean, but I didn't, I can speak about it, but it wasn't like a lot of hard work thinking about it. Do you know, but it's it took very organic. all of those months, if not years, yeah, of process. not thinking about it to have this moment that you call obvious that was genuinely inspired. Right, but, and I, but I guess what I'm saying when I agree with Lourdes is it comes in a very, from a very organic place. It's, it's like, you just feel it and you think about it, and it, it is from obsession. You you dream about it. I'm sure everyone does all night long. And you ru when you have a moment, your mind just goes, and you just think visually, how am I going to do this? I just want to yeah. say one uh, one thing. I think that we're aware that we are really making spectacle. You know, so that's a given. So we do think of our uh, audience, but to study the audience specifically. I think kills for me my vision. So uh, I think about them like they're gonna like this. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I made this cake Absolutely. for them. Absolutely. Yeah. Sure, sure. We're yeah. showmen, right? I mean, it's we're telling yeah. stories. We're we, yeah. so many of us have theatrical uh, theatrical backgrounds or other things like that. You speak of telenovela. I, we'll we'll speak of influences in a second. But Davis, yeah, I love the idea of jazz and and. Um, and I, I've never thought of it that way, but it really is, you know, you got to listen, if you're, and I'm not a musician, but I imagine if you are play jazz, you got to be able to listen, right? You got to hear what the other person's playing and you got to feel what the room is doing. But I also feel like, you know, a great jazz trio, you know, say, well, this is going to be in D, <laughs> you know, and we're going to do a, you know, it could be a song that we all know, you know, but we're going <laughs> to, you know, uh, so it's, that's the riddle. It's the riddle. It, um, it's so cool to talk, talk about this because no one, we were talking about this. No one talks about. Everyone wants to talk about like how I felt, but um, you know, I I have like three or four films I want to make that are hovering out there that I'm dying to make that I feel that passion about, but I don't know how to crack them. I don't know, you know, and um, so I'm dying to play jazz on in that story, but I need that frame I need that thing and I think to me that's the and it may be the simplest thing like you could find it going off jogging you know they when they've come to me it's like oh it's that um, but you need that frame or else you're just doing an endless guitar solo uh, that doesn't have any form what was what's the moment in waiting for Superman for you what's what was the well there there were two and it's interesting for me the form um, and Greg and I d we, we, we early on we decided this thing we're going to make two movies, <laughs> and we we're going to uh, keep them separate for ninety like till three weeks before we showed Sundance. We made a film about the kids going to the lottery, and we called it Other People's Children. And so the the, the, the frame of that was how do we get people to care about other people's children the way they the way that we care about our own. And that was that movie, and it could have been its own movie. And then we made another film called The Folly of the Adults which was the system that all of us have created. And that was the frame of the other movie. And, they, and those are like two frames that we had. And we said, what if we make them separately and, and make them work 
as their own movies and then cut them together at the last minute. So three weeks before we showed Sundance, we cut those stories together, one, hoping that they would, they would interrelate. So, and, and so that was, that, was the, that was how we cracked that. But, that, but that's, you, you know, and so. Fantastic. Amir, how about, uh, we're talking about form. form. Well, I mean, I think it's pretty much been said, I think it's important to watch other people's movies because that's what makes it, you know, people always say the documentary community, and I find it to be not really a community, except for the fact that, uh, you know, we're always, as a group, the, the, we're creating the boundaries of the, and we're pushing the boundaries of the medium. Uh, every year, um, like, it, it's the, the, the track record of what is possible, you know, moves outward. And if you watch a lot of movies, you, you give yourself more ideas on what you can do formally. Like you, in your movie, Lourdes, the, the whole scene with the, um, you have a toy sinking in the water. I mean, it's, it's also it's hard to describe, but I mean, it's an amazing use of, a, a, of like an allegorical kind of a, a toy um, tractor sinking in water. And I was just like, God, I want to try to do something like that sometime. You know, and so you watch a lot of movies and, and you try and remember them when you're struggling with these, with these issues. Molly, have you ever um, had a filmmaker work who was d doing a film for you and you thought their form was off or they weren't thinking of a certain kind of form or you had a, you had a perspective? Any, is there any, why don't you try uh, interviews? They're all hard, and, and, but as far as the actual form of the film, no, that would be. Or formal elements. For, no, I think basically I've had films go in a completely wrong direction for a while that I thought, and I don't think people disagreed. I think, you know, um, you know how it can be in the editing room. It's really hard to find it, and it's, it's, it's not working. <laughs> what did I tell you? It's, it's a mess until it's a masterpiece, right? You s it's, you've, you've sung that song to all of us. <laughs> I've heard that. <laughs> not, she will, though. Yeah, yeah, she yeah. will. <laughs> um, uh, we we've uh, we brought up uh, uh, Amir. You talk about seeing other people's films. We talk about jazz music. I wonder, first outside of documentary film, what inspires you? What non-documentary film things do you look to? Have you looked to for inspiration in your work, Amir? You want to start? Uh, music. I mean, we've keep everybody keeps saying it, but that is really where I. Uh, um, and, and in improvisational music, especially jazz and the Grateful Dead. Juan? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, improvisational music, I think, is really where I, I, I listen to that when I'm working. And um, yeah. Davis? Uh, psychotropic drugs. Mm -hmm. Yes, very good. The right brain. Uh, anything more you want to say? No, that's, that's the only place I look. Ricky, he stole your answer. Exactly. <laughs> um, no, mu I would say music. But, uh, uh, but anything can be an inspiration in an unexpected place in an unexpected time, you know? Usually in the shower. It's like silly places like that where you're like, oh, I have an idea, and then you have to write it down. Or usually sleeping, too. We, I'm sure everyone experiences this when you're, like, obsessing about a film. You have to have a piece of paper and a pen, and then, uh, you know, you write just down crazy ideas in the middle of the night. Lourdes? A lot of different places, um, a lot of people, a lot of people that I don't know that I meet in the bus or that I meet casually that tell me a story or um, maybe real tacky um, Mexican television. Um, I love that <coughs> stuff. And uh, art, you know, er every kind of art. Everything is, is inspirational, really. You know, you get an idea, a little idea here and another one there, and then you paste it all together and yes, make yes. something. You, like can't play, you can't play jazz if you, if you, if you don't listen, mm. you know? Yes. R RJ, I guess it's worth mentioning my father was a jazz musician, and we had, a lot of, we had a big house with a lot of young musicians coming through all the time, and what exasperated him to no end was young musicians who never had the ending and their songs worked out. They always just <laughs> wanted to like trail it out. Mm. You know, and it's like, you know, no, absolutely not. Like a song has an ending. So I think nice. films need to have endings. And I heard somebody say once recently that they're not going to do another film until they know how it ends. And I, th I just thought that was a really interesting 
because they can be, you know, it can be as you, you call it a rabbit hole. Like God, where you know, where does it end? Anyway, I thought no, it was it's a, it's a good point. It's funny because I was about to say that the, the, uh, one of the things I, so what's consistent about things I find that are, are inspiring me while I'm making films are people who have finished, you know, and I because I I get curious about the complete the complete thing, the complete work of art, whatever it is, the complete painting, the complete sculpture, the complete piece of music, the complete other film, the complete, you know, it's, I, I, I find that, I'm first of all, filled with envy that somehow they were able to complete, but then inspired by it and, and informed by it, and it becomes a really um, interesting thing. I brought up earlier a question, we're at the Academy, so I think it's, it's, it's worth asking again specifically, um, so many of our films end up, uh, we know they're going to end up on television, home video and all that. We, 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 um, we've all worked in both for television and film as an, uh, the initial point of the film, but, um, but I think we have a tendency to think about the films as theatrical films. I mean, Davis, you said to me the other day, you won't let a subject see a film on DVD, you want them to see it on the screen. Do you think differently about a film that you're making for the theater than you do about a film that you're making for television and, and how, Ricky, you're nodding. Well, I mean, uh, yeah, you, yes. But I think uh, if I have my choice, I always try to make something that's cinematic for the theater. Like, you always want it to have. And then you think about it just in terms of framing your shots. And um, if we shot something recently on, on UFOs that was for television, but we shot it really close up images and realized that, you know, that doesn't always work for television. You know, the, so um of faces you know and they we could see every pore in their face on like high def television it wasn't very nice but um e but i think i me personally i always would like prefer to make something that's going to have some kind of a theatrical life just lourdes well no i uh, you know I, I started thinking like that but it ended very soon you know there was no theatrical for my films mm -hmm. i mean maybe here and there. I mean, I'm much older than everyone else, so I started before. And uh, there wasn't a lot of expectations, but I love it when I see it, you know, when it's beautiful. Not like the way I saw it right now, because that was digital, you know? But the film is so beautiful. I'm in love with it, but it's, n you know. Do you still shoot uh, yes. uh, film? Sometimes, Lloyd, as sometimes, we call it. no. I'm, you know, we mix it, mm. yeah. And yeah. do you shoot, do you, did you find yourself shooting differently, as Ricky says, fa framing differently, anything, because, it, because you knew that television would be the first? No, I don't think about it like that at all, you know. I, I just, it's something that, I, it's not a consideration, it's like the audience. Yeah, yeah, sure, you're making the work. Davis, do you? Yeah, well my, my point about the theatrical, it, it sounds snobbish, but... You, I mean, w I think all of us are resigned that a lot of people are going to see our films on television. Mm -hmm. that I <laughs> um, but what, what I, what, um, what drives me nuts is when you're showing someone your film and they're in a distracted environment. You know, so, uh, you know, you, you just, you, you, some, some executive says, I want, uh, sorry. Uh, I want to see your film, and, and you think, well, they're just going to put it in their in their in their in their laptop, you know, and, and the phone's going to ring, and that's just not a good way to watch a movie. That that's my point. Is, is that you yeah. really want, um, you're 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 making a film, you know, th thinking that this person is watching only your movie, and 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 I think you have to. I I'm like protective on that. I, I'm very protective about that experience. I want people to just surrender to the story. I'm telling. But it is also a different film when it's 40 feet on a screen, high on a screen. It's a different experience. It's a, you know, I, I think it's different. And this goes back to the audience thing. It, for me, the film isn't really, it's, it's complete in certain ways when you're watching yourself, but the audience experience is what makes, what makes it live and breathe and bleed and... Together. Yeah, it's that, it is that, and, and it's always different. Every audience is different, every... Um, you know, and whether it's an individual experience or group experience, all those things. So, um, so it, it, it changes, it changes and, it ch and maybe it's because, uh, you know, I, I, 
Pennebaker used to always say, it's a theatrical film, it's a theatrical film. I won't even, you know, that was the, the refrain during the War Room, probably just because he, he just wanted everybody not to think in any other way. So it was, you know, it's a movie, it's a movie. The, the audience will come in, they'll take off their coats. We gotta get, you know, they won't, once they said it, once they, you gotta get them to take off their coats. Once they take off their coats, they won't be able to escape. And that, that's, you know, and, and it's a very interesting thing to think about that as opposed to the television thing, the distracted environment. I mean, I've, I, people who, I heard somebody once who makes television for a living, you know, say you just have to assume that they're getting up and wandering around. Yeah. You know, it's just a different thing. Amir, do you think about this? Um, I, you know, I've, I've only made three films and I've just been happy that anybody watched them in any medium, but... Um, <laughs> Uh, so I don't really make decisions that way. I'll just say one thing kind of related, which is that I feel like every cut in every film I've ever done has been like a few frames too short. And I always feel that when I see it on a big screen like this. Because you edit them on these tiny little computer monitors and you, your brain thinks that cuts need to happen more quickly than they actually do. Because on a big screen, you know, people need time to scan, there's more to experience, and they need time to experience it. And, I, and I've been trying, I get a little bit better at that every film, but I still, uh, I, I just, I, even just watching this, I was like, yeah, too quick, too quick, too quick. You know, just, just need to let a film breathe. And you, it's very hard to do that, cutting it on an Avid or a Final Cut. Say again, say again. Subtitles, think about stuff like that. You know, you need time. Yeah. You know, like for example, if your film is going to be translated into another language, then, you know, you need a little bit more time. Molly, television and theatrical? Do I have to answer this? Uh, sure. You mean, so, so the question is, are some films um, better for television? Is well, it's interesting. Your films premiere in theaters, are financed for television, yeah. will have a television life, you, when you're talking with your filmmakers, and uh, does it come up? The they're intended for s distribution cinema. in theaters, and they are that the point of the way we do the films is that we wait until after they've had a proper theatrical run and, and to put them on television. And and you know, a big part of the reason for that is that the audience, uh, you know, doesn't doesn't watch documentary films as much on television as they do in other ways. I and I actually I ho I have a lot of hope for VOD and for other forms of where, where the film can at least sustain its form and, and be watched in one long narrative as opposed to you know, being broken up or distracted or channels changing and all that. Um, you know, because the fact of the matter is theatrical distribution, is, it's, it's hard and it's Bright expensive. spots, Molly, bright spots. Bright spots, right, okay, right. It's um, wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what, I do want to say one thing, aren't I? It's here's a, here's Lourdes just said it's better spot. than when she was younger, so yeah, yeah, yeah. there's there a bright spot. But also, yeah. there's, a, there's some films that are not as good as they should be, and they are shown in theatrical you know, settings. And you know, the, I think the filmmakers are relying on that tension between the audience, and it doesn't necessarily exist always. You know, mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily always work that you can't, the captive audience, the coats off thing, you know. Mm. The other thing, of course, is that televisions get better and better, bigger and bigger. Sometime soon we'll have Steve Jobs television that he left behind for us, and it's apparently going to be remarkable. Right. So maybe, you know, maybe the television experience becomes more, and as it becomes more and more cinematic, uh, we have another bright spot. I'm trying something slightly different uh, right now, an experiment to embrace the distraction factor and I'm taking uh, the Tillman story and I'm turning it into a kind of like a non-linear web-based version of itself where you can you can actually it's like you say like uh, to find it any this is this is to fulfill the dream of not ever having to end it I'm putting all my outtakes and all the documents like you saw those documents in the little clip those will be available and I'm just thinking that a lot of people do watch documentaries and then stop and Google, like, wait, did this really happen yeah. this way? And I'm trying to, like, make something that formally embraces that so that people can navigate away, like an old choose-your-own-adventure kind of thing, and then come back to it and, another, you know, uh, Yeah, and another yeah. bright spot. I mean, the DVD, the DVD extras, the films you get to make that, you, you know, the scenes that you yeah. don't have to, uh, 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 you know, that you don't have to let go of, even though you, they don't belong in your movie, but you know you love them so much. There's a place for them. 
the web-like experience that, uh, that you can create from this now multi-disc opportunity, and, um, which is a great thing. Uh, I want to talk, we're, 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 we're nearing the end, and we'll see if we can uh, open the conversation. Maybe we'll have time for a few questions. But um, uh, I'm sure students are watching this, people who aspire to make films. Uh, so my last few questions will be aiming towards that. Is there, can you think of a story of something that, ha that happened to you while you were making a film that taught you a lesson that you will never forget? Something that's instructive. I'm giving you a few seconds, and now, Amir, please tell us. Oh, God, don't, the Jeopardy moment, no. <laughs> yeah? Well, you're starting, Amir, right? Yeah. Oh, no, Amir, go. No, you I need go. to think. Why don't you, 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 I don't you have must have thought of something. Yeah, you have. I, 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 I don't, tr I try never to learn any lessons in life. Just <laughs> go straight on. I, I got one. Thank okay. you. Um, <laughs> just, um, you know, my father made documentaries, and, uh, and he was my greatest teacher. And I used to work for him to sort of, I used to, the first thing I did was like um, run the cables to the lights. This is in like the six, late 60s and the 70s. <coughs> and, I, and, and then finally, um, um, before I moved out here, um, he was like, you know, um, uh, there's a person I need you to interview. I can't go. Will you go interview that person? I was like, oh, my God. You know, I'm, I'm no longer just, you know, helping out. Now I can actually do something. And so um, I stayed up all night and I wrote a long list of questions about what I, what I would interview this person. And I came to my father and I went to his desk and I said, so he, he, would you look at my questions? I'm leaving the airport tomorrow, you know, this afternoon. And, and, he, and he goes, he read them, he goes, these are, this is, you know, and he goes, um, I have only one advice for you. And it's the only piece of advice he ever gave me. He goes, don't have questions. You know, and, and the point being that, you know, um, be in the moment, like jazz, listen, you know, uh, you know, be, you know, uh, you could be asking the right question at the very wrong moment. You know, and, and I, it's sometimes when people interview me, it's like, I'm just thinking about something and then they go, so what, you know, where were you born? And you're like, huh. like, because you've, you're out of, you know, you're, you're talking about this and they bring you over here. And so the, 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 the act of interviewing is, a, is not necessarily the act of, going down a list of questions. It's the act of, of listening and, and experiencing uh, and, and, and being, a, uh, I don't know, but, but, but maybe playing jazz. Wait, so you, you actually never have a list of questions? I mean. Sometimes I'll have, like, you know, don't forget to, to ask right. about, you know, um, you know, the oil tanker. Like, but, but, you know, I, I'll put them in my pocket, and generally I won't take them out because... If you trust the interview and you just go for it and, and follow it, it's interesting. And even if the, you know, usually I start really over here, even though I want to go over there, that by the end you get there. And you made an entire film built around just the a, a, a natural, engaged, listening series of conversations. Yeah, so the last couple of films I just interview people audio only and we, I just like it, have these long conversations. And they just go or like if you were just interviewing someone, where, you know, what are you interested in? And out of that comes the sort of pieces that make a movie. So it's more jazz, yeah. Ricky? A lesson learned? Um, I think I said it earlier. I, I think I said it earlier with really um, l l um, seeing what you have. Just to see what's in front of you and, and let that be in the story and not try to control it too much. I mean... Um, did really listening. Was there a time where you controlled too much and had to? Ch I mean, I think tr earlier in my, I, I, I thought it had to be this way, and I, you know, um, this is the story, and I was, yeah, I think w attempting to make the story that I set out to make. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, one example is this Daryl Hunt film that took like 13 years to make. You know, I mean, it was it was constantly sort of chasing the next lead, but um, it was. It was going to be about um, you know th this man who was wrongly convicted, um, and ultimately gets out of prison, and we can we could make the film. But you know it took 13 years for you know he was in prison for almost 20 years, and it took just never you know just putting. Uh, I mean, I guess I was lucky there was an end. It could have ended up not having an end, c which I thought for many years it wasn't going to have an end. But I mean, you just never know. I guess was, I guess that's my point with that. The other thing I will say is to. N 
um, it's not. It doesn't hurt to have a contract with someone who maybe, <laughs> who is someone who maybe, at the very end, may decide she or he um, doesn't want their story to be told. I mean, contracts aren't such a bad thing. But um, usually, I mean, I'm sure everyone would say this that sometimes the contract is finished the day you finish shooting your movie, right? Mostly now, if you even get a contract, that's probably something you don't have to do. Yeah. yeah. Make an you you mean make a make an arrangement with your subject? Yeah, I mean, uh, sadly to say, I, d I think you know years ago you never had to do that. People were just not. But now, with so much reality television, so much, it's 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 a good idea to just get it out out front, like what it is that you're doing with this person. I mean, as I said, it can take. I don't know how it was with Vogue, but it can. Well, I'm doing something with Vogue now. We're we're finished shooting. We still haven't signed the contracts. I right. Haven't signed, I don't have a contract. Okay. No, I'm only kidding. Yeah, it, but yeah. it took it, it it's takes a big corporation. Yeah, well, but anyone, even an individual, sometimes. Sure. Took a very long time, very long time. But thank God, because the central tenet of it was Final Cut, and without it, different movie. <laughs> um, Lourdes? <laughs> um, uh, many lessons where you stick your foot in your mouth. Um, but one of them is having a release, you know? That's super important. Say more and about that. Uh, well, um, I had, like in The Devil Never Sleeps, I had my um, uncle's wife, the widow, um, I, I did an interview with her on the phone, and I knew she was going to betray me, so I, I recorded the phone call, and I tried to get... Uh, a release, and she, of course, would never give me one. Yeah. You know, and it, it, it took a while for me to distribute the film because I didn't have that release. Yeah. So, you know, that's super important, and I think that was a lesson that I learned the hard way. Yeah. yeah. Did you get that release? I was wondering, watching your film. I'll tell you later. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, sometimes another... I'm uh, not going to uh, serve another you. Another uh, good lesson is to... Uh, don't be afraid to have the bank robber's mentality, you know? It's, uh, um, you know, sometimes it's better to, uh, to apologize yeah. than to uh, ask for permission. permission and not get it, right? Um, Amir? Uh, well, I mean, we're kind of morphing, uh, we've all been talking about lessons that we've learned, but I think in, if, in terms of you kids out there, um, <laughs> I'll say transcripts. I, I was talking to a friend of mine who's a filmmaker, he doesn't use transcripts. I don't know how you guys, but I don't know how you would make a film at least the kind of films I make, I don't know how you would do it without transcripts. And it's very inexpensive now because they ship them out to Bangalore or something. Uh, you can get them done in India. Um, and sometimes they get the words wrong. But I mean, it's... So I, you're I, saying not only yeah. transcripts, but outsource. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. I have some Take nice NYU um, grad, <laughs> film grads who will transcribe for free. I, uh, oh, wow. I, 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 yes. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Molly? Um, well... I guess one of the things that I've learned is from the filmmakers that I've had the privilege of working with um, that there are going to be very difficult moments and that what's so important is to go through those moments with grace if you can. I mean, you're going to get angry. You're going to have fights. I think we've had a few fights, RJ, but we came through it. I mean, John Batzek, too, when we had some terrible times on, on the Tillman story, and a lot of them didn't really have to do with us necessarily. There were other you know, greater forces. But, you know, John was so grace, gracious about things with me. And I've always just been so grateful for that. And I really appreciated it. And, and you know, you go through life and the, it's, it's in, I walked away feeling like that I grew from that experience, mm -hmm. from, from having him be so generous about mm -hmm. what a difficult moment So So your lesson is that when you're fighting with your filmmakers, they should be gracious to you. They should be nice <laughs> to me. <laughs> You're gracious too, Molly. That is an excellent, no. excellent lesson. I think you have to be good at, 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 at having fights and yes. staying friends. And the people who you want to work with, again, are the ones who you can have those fights with and then, you know, and, and, have, and have it be done in a gracious way. And, and then, you know, I feel that way about you, Molly. <laughs> and, uh, one of the, no, um, but, yeah. one of the other way. uh, ways I think we know we're in a special moment, call it a golden age or what you will of documentary film, is that there are so many now more than, at least when I was beginning, career filmmakers. 
people don't make one film where they spend their entire life savings on it and then they think, my God, who would ever do this again? And some do, but there are people who make a film and then another film and then another film and then another film and so much so, you know, you see Sundance adjusting and, you know, it used to be that all filmmakers were in the competition and now they have a section just for, uh, you know, film, career filmmakers whose films shouldn't be in competition anymore. They should just be featured and the younger first or second time filmmakers work is featured in, in the competition and you see it in lots and lots of ways and one of the things you learn is that life is long and you know we're and I, I think that does Amir contribute to community in a good way um, and, and, uh, and give us hope. Here's my quick lesson which is about um, it's another Pennebaker story which uh, I'm always delighted to tell but we're um, we're, we're in Little Rock having realized that uh, that that the only way to make the war room is to make it a film about James Carville because Bill Clinton won't have anything to do with us and um, and uh, that's that and uh, and we go down to talk to James and uh, we had done some shooting and we had seen what he's like in film and it's spectacular he's clearly a, a movie star and we asked George Stephanopoulos maybe we can make this movie about James and about you and he said it's all it's really it's all up to James so we go down to Little Rock and we meet with James and Penny's there with Chris Hedges's longtime filmmaking partner and wife, and and uh, and Wendy Ettinger, the producer, and I are there, and we're sitting and we're talking to him, and 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 we tell him what we want to do, and James says, "Look, the only thing that matters to me is getting Bill Clinton elected president. It's the only thing. It's my whole life has been leading up to this moment. I, I that's all that matters. If I let you make a film, I'm going to be thinking about other things. I'm going to be thinking about whether I'm." cussing and my mother hears me cussing, I'm thinking about the way I look, I'm thinking about, so why on earth would I possibly do this? And my impulse was to answer his question and say, you're doing it for history, you're doing it for it's, because it's important, you're doing it because you, there's all these reasons I had the answer. And um, though I had the wrong idea, I did have the good sense in that moment to hold my tongue because I was sitting there with Penny and Chris and, uh, and there was a long pause and I was just looking, I was like, tell him, tell him. And Penny said, you know what, James, I know why I want to do this. I want to tell stories about people who care a tremendous amount about what they're doing and who do it as well as they possibly can under high stakes circumstances. This is what matters to me. It gives me great satisfaction in my work and it is my life's work but I can't possibly tell you why you would want to do it. It's none of my business. And I thought, well, that's the craziest effing answer I've ever heard. What are you doing? Sell, close. <laughs> there was another pause and uh, I was like, Rrr. and James thought for a second, he said, okay, thank you for saying that, let me think about it. And we went back to the hotel room and I was, we were all kind of sitting around and I was, pacing, sometimes stomping, because, I, and I was like, Penny, why, why, why? Why that answer? Like, when, and he said, the story doesn't belong to me. It doesn't belong to us. It belongs to James. He's the only one who can give it to us. And he has to make that decision. If he makes that decision, we'll be able to make a film. If he doesn't, it doesn't matter. There's no movie to be made. A couple of hours passed, the phone rang. James said, come on down, shoot. We started filming, we made the movie, the rest is history. The great lesson, of course, in the, uh, particularly in the Verite film, I think, is that the film belongs to the subject. Everything you must do, everything you do must reflect that, must, must reflect your understanding of it, your appreciation of it, and I swear every, that's all I think about when I'm in the field to this day, and I think when we're shooting every minute, all the time, the only reason we could film Grace Coddington in the September issue is because we were able to convince her after four months of her not letting us film her, that we believed it was her story, that it belonged to her, that we wanted, we, we appreciated that, and on and on. That's my tale. I have one last question. I lied, we're not gonna be able to open the, this to questions, uh, which is probably not a bad thing, because I feel as though our panelists have done such um, beautiful work answering my questions. <laughs> you have whatever amount of money you need, Access is a given. Resources are a given. What film would you make that you're not already making? Is that a fair question to ask? No. Yeah. <laughs> or, oh, interesting. What's your dream film? Obstacles are none. Please? Come on. 
Molly Thompson. But I'm, I'm doing that. Oh, we'll do it. Tell us then. No, I can't. Your dream has come true. I can't tell you that one. Um, I, it, 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 I can't think of anything else but <laughs> this executive compensation on Wall Street right now. I mean, I know that that's, it seems so obvious, but I feel like if I could make that film and make it relevant and make it, I feel like that's the, the biggest problem that we ha are facing right now. And, and uh, you know, that's what, Occupy Wall Street's all about, and it's not a good answer though because somebody's going to make that film. Probably Alex Gibney will make that film, or you know, somebody will make that film. He's but I would like He's that's the it. only film I can think of that I really want to make right now. Amir, it's bad news for those of us who are pitching you ideas in the <laughs> coming days and weeks. No, um, well, I, I mean, I'm, it's a tough, it's a really tough question. Um, uh, I'll tell you what I'm thinking about these days that I still haven't cracked, um, but I, I want to make a film that is a little bit like, uh, like the kind of films Diane makes, like you saw that water film, but about narcissism. You know, like a, about, I read this book written in 1979 um, called Culture of Narcissism, which is this brilliant, it's almost like reading uh, Nostradamus or something because he's talking about Facebook and Twitter and, and reality TV, but none of those things existed. And, um, and, it's just an interesting way of looking at the, at, at the moment in time we're in. So I, it's a kind of an essayist movie about narcissism. And there's an interesting kind of, there's, a, there's an interesting dram dramatic arc to it because he was called in by, um, by Carter to, uh, to advise him on the Malay speech. I was telling you this outside. And, um, and the Malay, so, so this Malay, the, the quote unquote Malay speech in 1979 was informed by this culture of narcissism book, and it was a uh, political disaster, you know, because Carter did exactly what we say we always want our leaders to do, which is tell us the truth and have us aspire to something higher, and people didn't want to hear that. They wanted to hear that we're the greatest country in the history of the world. And Reagan turned around and did that. And so it's, it's an interesting kind of avenue into the birth of the modern conservative movement, into Twitter, into all these things. As you can see, it's not yet a well-formed idea, but that's kind of what I'm thinking about. But the about great news is you have endless amounts of money to make it. Yes, right. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Yes. Davis? <laughs> well, um, I, I never do this, and I, but I wa uh, I, first of all, I want to thank RJ for, uh, for tonight. It, it's, this is the most, Thanks, and, and, and Rob Epstein and everyone else in the Academy. I mean, it's genuine. I, I, um, I f sometimes feel like these panels are about how to get your film made and the misery of it, and, and to actually, yeah. I'm like, like so excited. Uh, Thanks, I want to make a movie right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> you make no. a movie about so, this. So, so I mean, the, the the thing that the thing that the one that's really hovering right now, and and is is, um, and I don't know, I have no idea how to do it, uh, but I just have this this um, fr phrase in my head that democracy is sick. It, democracy is sick, and that like you know if. It, and that all the things that, that piss me off or that feel dysfunctional um, on both sides of the spectrum come down to like that we, you know, the, and, 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 but I have no, and so that's, that's and, and I want to figure out how to do that, but I don't know how to do it. Molly, would you ever do like an omnibus where different filmmakers take a look at a theme, for instance, like democracy is sick and have ways of, it's probably yeah. on so many but of our no minds No one else now. can do that one. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> I, I just said that. You know, he slammed it. He cabaret. <laughs> RJ's trying to write himself into Davis's film. I, 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 and I have another pitch about <laughs> <laughs> about Amir's idea. <laughs> Too late. This is how you get to d make twenty television shows. Uh, but no, seriously, would, have you ever thought about that? films? Well, I I think they're tricky because I think they can be very very deeply uneven, and I don't know if for television. You know, I think y it's not necessarily, I think the, the singular overall vision of, you know, if you were to do 10 films, I think that might be more important than individual visions. Mm, mm. I don't know if that's a good television stunt to do. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I think it's been done, and I don't think it's always successful. Yeah. Okay. Ricky? <laughs> um, I think if I, politically, I'd like to do about a film about women in politics. And sort of this new trend of women, women politicians, and where that's going, but that's in the thinking side. But on the feeling side, um, I, I, no, I would love to do a, a like a, a, a movie about um, a rocker, like a, 
a, a good music movie about maybe like a a musician that that sort of came and went, sort of a portrait of, um, and or an artist, just a visual artist, but but something that feels contemporary that people would pay money to go see a movie theater. But you know something that is feels con that people would want to go and see. Oh, great, Lourdes. Um, if I had all the money in the world, I would like to make a film about dreams and memory. You know, that's that's something I would like to do. Um, my my uh, fantasy project uh, uh, emulates Michael Apted's great work in Seven Up. I would love to follow a life over a lifetime, or what's left of the time I would have in it. I think uh, I've, I've envied those who've had lifelong projects, and, and uh, that's a fantasy I have. I hope for all of you that your dreams come true, um, and uh, we all thank all of you for being here tonight. Molly Thompson, Amir Barlev, Davis Guggenheim, Ricky Stern, Lourdes Portilla. Thank you all so much. Thanks, RJ. Thank you, RJ. Thank you, RJ. That was fun.